good evening everybody please be seated oh oh that's right sabar shalom please look at one another and greet them sabar shalom looking at the many banners in this church it tells me that they are lovers of israel not only they have the flag of israel over there but also the ancient hebrew writing at the back of this church have you, that is the ancient hebrew writing a uh, dating at the time of before moses during that time of seth i once had a heavenly encounter in jerusalem where i fell into a trance and i was in a particular place and it looked like um, there was a wooden structure or like a uh, like an entrance gateway and on the top of the structure there was a big board with some ancient writing like those letters and a saint stood at the entrance way and he told me read it i said sir i do not know this language i do not know how to read it he said yes you can read it and he said okay repeat after me and he said the first word and i repeated the first word and i could then read the entire sentence so when i read that sentence the door opened to enter into the very uh, vistas in heaven so that writing is quite little quite similar to this kind of writings so shabbat shalom everybody all right so i'm i'm glad you, i'm i hope you are happy and good in the lord you know there are many empty seats in here and over here all you wonderful saints who are sitting so far away please move over to the center so that i don't have to strain my neck to see you and at the end of my trip in Mor- moravian falls i need to see a chiropractor <laughs> see that's why you are here <laughs> and there's a cryo- ch- chiropractor in the house so i can <laughs> are we all good yeah. all right you know yesterday i mentioned to you about um the covid-19 pandemic that came all over the world and some good thing and some bad things came as a result of the covid-19 so many good things happened many bad things happened and among the many good things one good thing happened to me and that is during the lockdown so i spent much time fasting and praying so all of you are in the outer court so this is the holy place here so why are you in the outer court so the good thing that happened to me was i spent much fa- days fasting and praying and one day on april the 28 2020 as i was waiting on the lord the lord jesus appeared to me and spoke to me to begin an online school like a bible college and uh, then he explained to me how the school should be function how to make the school the syllabus the purpose and everything and the main purpose was to prepare the end time army of god to teach and to train see i'm here for three days after that you won't see me again for the next 5 years who knows right <laughs> no <laughs> well whether if not 5 years as a 1 year or 2 year during the intervening period we don't see each other too often right so the one, one way is to be trained by this school i'm sure when you entered this uh, church today you all received this brochure did you yes. is there anyone who didn't receive a brochure okay there is you didn't receive can you please put up your hands those who have not received and the, the where's my wonderful ushers or oh, my wonderful team okay they 
Just keep your hands straight up so that they will come and give you all my Nepali chora churi aru. Tachay na. Pichara. See, the, over there, put up your hands all Nepali chora churi aru. Those saints, please uto. Uto, uto. All these are wonderful Nepali sons and daughters. They've come from... They come from far away, not Nepal, but Syracuse. Syracuse in New York. Still a far away place, right? Far away. Pastor. So I was with them last year in their church. So I didn't go this year. So this year they decided to come here. <laughs> so, Instead of me talking too much about this school, I'm going to show you a video that will explain about the school in a much better way. Can you please play the video? Do you want to be prepared for the end times? Do you want to know the Lord Jesus? Walk with Him, talk with Him, and work with Him? then Last Days Prophetic Training College is the place for you. At LDPTC, our vision is to prepare a company of end times believers to fulfill the purposes of the Lord Jesus. Our college consists of eight schools, which will train you to see and hear what the Father God does and says so that you can do His will. School of End Times Army, School of End Times Studies, School of Prophets, School of Prophetic Evangelism, School of Prophetic Pastor, School of the Spirit, School of Prayer, School of Biblical Studies. Our curriculum was carefully designed after much prayer and revelation, with 95% of courses taught by Brother Sadhu. Our courses focus on practical training, preparing you for ministry in the real world. And the best part, you can start your studies anytime, all year long. The Diploma in Biblical Studies program is currently available and is a prerequisite that needs to be completed before signing up for other courses in the future. It is a 10 months course that provides a focused study of the Bible, an overview of systematic theology, and practical ministry training. Our faculty has over 200 years of ministry experience and we have more than a thousand hours of teaching material online. Plus, we have over 7,000 alumni students from all over the world. LDPTC has received accreditation by AICCS, Transworld Accrediting Commission International, the National Bible College Association, and Theological Accreditation International which have a combined total of more than 2,000 member institutions. Our courses are very affordable, and we even offer part payment plans. So what are you waiting for? Visit our website at ldptc.org or email us at info at ldptc.org to start your journey towards fulfilling God's purpose. where you'll be equipped to fulfill the Lord's purposes in the end times. Amen. Amen. You know, they say, a picture speaks a thousand words. Rather than me speaking thousand words, <laughs> that picture spoke more than thousand words. So, in these schools, I teach at in great depth, which, which I don't do in a public conference. And um, so this is a legacy that I will leave behind to train this generation, next generation, and the future generations for the coming of the Lord Jesus. So the purpose is this, preparing the army of God for the last days. This morning I had a wonderful 
visitation from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he didn't speak anything about you. He spoke about me. It's my, it's my turn. On. Today was my turn, you know. <laughs> Yesterday was your turn. And tomorrow will also be your turn. Today was my turn. And the Lord spoke to me about uh, among the many things that I should do. One was the school. He said, you must concentrate building the school and prepare the army for the last days. Because you do not know one thing the Lord told me, which I will just share with you in one sentence. He said this, tell my people, they do not know how dangerous, terrible it will be in the end times. They don't know. When the scripture says, it's time of Jacob's trouble. What can we understand by that? Just two words, Jacob's trouble. Or, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, it will be such a terrible time that the world since creation has not seen yet. Now how can we imagine that? We cannot imagine. Therefore, we must be prepared to face the onslaught of the enemy in the last days. And the Bible says very clearly in Revelation chapter 12 that we will also fight against the enemies of God. So if we are going to fight against the enemies of God, of course with spiritual weapons, still the engagement is in human terms. So you need to how to fight. We have the sword of the spirit in our hands. You need to know how to wield the sword of the Lord. If you do not know how to wield the sword of the Lord, instead of striking the enemy, we will be striking one another like we are presently doing. Right? We are killing one another among the Christians more than we are killing the enemy. How sad. So, don't criticize anyone. Don't gossip. Don't backbite anybody. Even if they have genuinely done a mistake, it is not your duty to criticize. If you find someone making a mistake, even if it is me, come and talk to me. That's the godly thing to do. Not post a video on YouTube. See, all those are ideas from demons who give you those ideas to shame God's people. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness. He doesn't shame us. Let me give you one very good example. In John chapter 8, a woman caught in adultery was brought to the Lord Jesus. And a whole mob of crowd were accusing her. In fact, I was once shown in a vision how the sin looked like. When the mob was dragging the poor woman along the streets, her clothes were all torn and she was almost naked. That was how she was brought before the Lord. And in her nakedness, she just hid her face in the sand. Totally ashamed to look up. And the whole mob was looking at her naked body and they were they had stones in their hands ready to stone her to death. And they wanted a confirmation from the Lord Jesus to stone her. Like what we, we are doing today, no? Today they say, oh, the Holy Spirit inspired me to write a, against someone on the internet. Those who do that claim that they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Have you heard like that before? Sure, you were inspired by a spirit, not the Holy Spirit. That's true. You were inspired, it's true, but not by the Holy Spirit. So, so they asked a confirmation from the Lord to stone her, and the Lord just ignored whatever everybody said, and he just wrote on the sand something, and eventually 
He looked up and he said, He who is without sin, you cast the first stone. So from the youngest to the oldest, felt convicted. See, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. You see a demonstration of the work of the Holy Spirit. As soon as the Lord Jesus spoke those words, they were convicted in their hearts. They dropped their stones and they all left. Everyone left. And the Lord Jesus continued writing on the ground. After everyone had left, he looked up and he saw nobody there and he asked the woman, where are your persecutors? And she, only then she looked up and she saw no one and she told the Lord, there's no one Lord. And the Lord said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now when the Lord Jesus spoke that word, go and sin no more, it proved that she was guilty. Right? If he had said those words earlier, the whole mob would have stoned her. But the Lord waited for everyone to disappear. And then he dealt with her privately. He dealt with her privately and he hid his, her sin from everyone else. But he forgave her and he told her, go and live a life, no more sinful life. Don't go back to your sinful life. He forgave her. He did not condone her adulterous lifestyle. He accepted her. He loved her. But he did not accept her lifestyle. So is it true concerning the LGBTQRZ people? God loves all of them, right? But he doesn't condone their lifestyle. That lifestyle is not acceptable in the kingdom of God. The people accept it, but not the lifestyle. So you see, in this incident, the Lord Jesus did not shame the woman publicly. He dealt with her privately. That is the godly way to deal with offenses or mistakes. Not publishing on the social media for everybody. See, that is the work of the devil that shames publicly. When Samson was caught in adultery, he was dragged from all the streets of Philistines for everyone to mock at him. They spitted on him. He became a laughing stock. That's the work of the devil. Shames you publicly. But the Holy Spirit deals with you privately. Amen? Amen. That's the appetizer. Amen. Let's arise for a word of prayer. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus. We come before your holy presence by the blood of the Lamb of the Living God. Thank you Holy Father for gathering all your dear children from far and near once again tonight. As they stand before you Lord, I ask you Spirit of the Living God, open their hearts. Open their ears. Give them an understanding heart and a listening ear that they may hear what the Spirit of God will speak to them 
and the churches in these last days. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Before you sit, while I was praying, did you heard a baby praying together with me? That baby prayed together with me because that was the baby I dedicated in the month of April. So the baby recognized my voice. Please be seated everybody. Before I share the word of God with you tonight, I'm going to preface my message with some little biblical foundation so that we can all flow together in the same page. You know, in these last days, God is going the kingdom of God is going to come near to us. Everybody believes that? Yeah. All right. The kingdom of God is not just does not only consist of God. It consists of all the beings in the kingdom of God. Yes. Agreed everybody? Yes. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10, we read that the family in heaven and the family on earth will be joined together in these last days. So the family on earth, we all understand because that's each one of us. But then the Apostle Paul says, there is also a family in heaven. So what is that family in heaven? Not just people who have died and gone home to be with the Lord, but also the angels of God, the saints in glory, the different classes of the angels of God, the seraphim, the cherubim, and then there are the 24 elders, and, and the sons of God. And then there's another group of stars, angels called the morning stars. And the f- living creatures. So many beings in heaven, which compose of the family of God. So if the family of God and the family on earth are going to become one, then we will get to fellowship with the family in heaven. Everybody agrees? So, then we should become very familiar with the cherubim. We should become familiar with the seraphim. We should get familiar with the saints of God in heaven, which the Bible calls us spirits of just men made perfect. Those who have gone ahead before us. Everybody agrees? Are we on the same page? All right. Now we see many references to the angelic ministry in the Bible. From the Old Testament to the New Testament is flooded with my rights of examples. So I don't need to give you all the references because you are already familiar with angelic ministry. But what we are most seldom familiar with are or is the ministry of the saints in glory. The one visible time that we read about them that is so explicitly mentioned took place on the Mount of Transfiguration. When the Lord Jesus Christ was praying, the heavens were open and two saints in glory, they appeared before the Lord Jesus. And who are they? Okay, you all pass. Now you qualify to take my school. Who are they? Now, look at what the scripture says. Appeared in glory. Which means they are not from the dead. They are alive and living. If they are just dead in the ground, they cannot appear in glory. Agreed everybody? For them to appear in glory... And the word glory in the Greek is the same word used all throughout the Bible about the glory of God. Same. So which means the two saints came directly from heaven. All agreed? Are we in the same page? All right. You believe that? All right. See, this is the most visible thing in the New Testament concerning the life of the Lord Jesus. However, there are several other references in the Old Testament 
which are subtle but when you really read them carefully then you'll find that it's also mentioned in the old testament the prophet daniel experienced this in daniel chapter 8 verses 15 to 17 he had a visitation from a man whether it's an angel or just an ordinary man he didn't know and one of the reason is because not all angels have wings did i disappoint you sorry if i did but that is the truth not all angels have wings that is the reason why when they appear many times they saw them just as a man without wings when uh, in one meeting i mentioned this and someone asked me a question then how did they fly <laughs> like superman <laughs> superman has no wings right how does superman fly if superman can fly why not a being from heaven Amen. am i right everybody yeah. right a man from krypton can fly I always wonder how does superman fly he he we can do it certainly amen. angels in heaven can do it amen it is okay we will not go into that that is <laughs> sometimes i'm tempted and i'm get i get carried away no we will not go over that because that's not my subject so and then in chapter 8 verses 13 to 14 it specifically says the prophet daniel saw two saints no the word saints is never used for an angel never because angels have never sinned when they have never sinned why call them holy one they are not holy ones the the title holy ones is never used for an angel they are always just simply called an angel but here in daniel chapter 8 verses 13 and 14 a specific word holy one is mentioned and two of them they appeared before the prophet daniel because the prophet daniel entered into a trance experience and when he was in the trance he saw these two saints and they were talking among themselves and he heard their conversation because he was part of the company he heard their conversation and then he wrote down what they heard and then in chapter 12 verses 5 to 13 again he was in a participation with a company of saints who were discussing among themselves concerning the prophecies of the last days and he was in the company and he was in fellowship with them and he heard their conversation so that is a one evidence from the old testament i give you one evidence from the new testament i'll give you another evidence from the new testament in the book of revelation the apostle john who wrote the book of revelation had an awesome experience with saints if you read revelation chapter 1 verse 1 it says god the father revealed to the son the revelation and the son spoke to the apostle john through his angel am i right everybody you see the scripture there you see the word angel there all right underline the word angel in your bible take note of the word angel an angel right am i right everybody an angel right okay then in look at chapter 19 and the verse 10 Chapter 19 verse 10 says ah they are taking time see that's the thing this the way I told you quickly turn to your bible chapter 9 see still not there if you have your good old fashioned bible you can quickly turn to chapter 19 verse 10 still not there they got the wrong scripture 1910 right thank you now look at the scripture now this is the same angel I fell at his feet to worship him but he said to me see that you do not do that I am your fellow servant now underline the word fellow servant 
no angel is a fellow servant to us and of your brethren angels never call us brother or sister no they cannot they cannot qualify because they are not born into the family of god your fellow servant and your brethren who have the testimony of jesus angels do not have the testimony of the lord jesus see and the spirit of prophecy angels do not have the gift of prophecy in them so this angel mentioned in revelation 11 cannot be an angel right right now let's look at another scripture revelation chapter 22 verses 8 and 9 and let's see if they get it fast this time no okay let's do the oh, oh okay good now i john saw and heard these things and when i heard and saw fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things right now you got the word angel there look at verse 9 and verse 9 takes a long time to come and he said see that you do not do that i am your fellow servant now this cannot be an angel and of your brother in the prophets ah your brother in the prophets which means this angel that appeared to the apostle john from chapter 1 is one of the prophets who lived in ancient times who was sent by god to speak to the apostle john and reveal to him the entire revelations that ended up in the book of revelation amen everybody accept that good you all believe that that is a very weak yes do you believe or you don't believe so just to feel your belief let me quote an example that one of the prophet that morning star ministry very highly respects bob jones you will believe that more than what i said right <laughs> okay in one of uh, the uh, brother bob jones had many many wonderful spiritual encounters am i right everybody yeah. so among the many wonderful spiritual encounters one day as he was waiting on the lord he fell into a trance and he had a visitation from a man who looked like me not me okay who looked like me wearing a saffron robe and with a turban on his head and a little taller about maybe about 6 feet tall i'm just a shorty and the saint spoke with him he spoke with him and told him something and then he asked him who are you and he mentioned his name brother bob jones could not uh, understand the name and then he said ask paul keith about me and he will tell you who i am you know who's paul keith davis yeah. all right So when he then Bob Jones called Paul Keith Davis and when he heard the description he told him the person you saw was Sadhu Sundar Singh So he appeared to Bob Jones and spoke with him So now do you all believe yes. 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 See this is the reason why earlier on I held back from revealing some things to you all right do we all believe yes okay. good <laughs> now why did i lay this foundation for you is because in these last days the saints in glory will appear they will appear to work together with the last days church they will work together because some of them have gone home to be with the lord before they completed their ministry in hebrews chapter 11 verse 40 it says that they without us 
are not com perfected, not completed. Now, one of the call of the prophet Moses was to bring the children of Israel into the promised land. Am I right? Did he do that? No. So, incomplete. So, in the last days, he will come back again to complete his ministry as one of the two witnesses. So, they will work together with the last days church. Why? Because as a human, they will understand our difficulties. They will understand our passion. They will understand our emotions. An angel cannot understand all that, you know. The angels, when they come, although they have emotions and they fellowship among themselves, but they cannot understand the human emotion because humans have fallen. Angels have not fallen. So they will not know how to sympathize when you fall to sin. They'll just say, sin not. But if a saint comes, he'll put his arm around you and he will tell you, you can do it again. Come on, get up. I walked through the same path. You can do it again. If Jonah comes to you, he will say, you know, I too fail God. So you are not that bad. So come on, just like I repented, you too repent. And you too will come out of your will, like I came out of my will. And we can do the work of God one more time. That's the purpose God sends these saints, to sympathize with us, who can understand with us. That is why when the saints Moses and Elijah, they appeared before the Lord Jesus, Luke chapter 9 verse 30 and 31 says, they spoke with the Lord Jesus concerning the death that he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. See how terrible it's going to be, the Lord didn't know at that point of time. Elijah, who feared death, could now tell the Lord Jesus, Lord, I went through that. You will go through that. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus looked at his disciples and said, I am sorrowful unto death. Right? Sorrowful unto death. He even feared dying. Do you know that? Is it scriptural? Yes, it is. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. For one brief moment, he feared that all the pains, all the sufferings that was going to go through, they flashed before his eyes. It pained him to death. So Elijah was there to encourage him. And the prophet Moses, he had failed the Lord. So he encouraged, Lord, you cannot fail. You cannot fail. The whole world is depending on you. Even not only the world, even heaven is depending on you to complete the race and become the captain of our salvation. So they encourage him. This is what the saints will do. Not only that, they will also come and unravel the word of God to you. By the grace of God, I was richly blessed with this one gift. Even before I knew anything about this, in November, on November 11th, 1983, as we were fasting and praying together with a few men of God, the Lord Jesus appeared in front of us and said, I'm going to bless you and make a covenant with you all, whatever covenants you will make with me. So there were three of us, and one by one, they were all making covenants with God, and then God will in return make a covenant with us. So when it, when it came to my turn, I was wondering in my mind, what covenant shall I make with the Lord? What? I have given my entire life to the Lord. What can I make? Before I could open my mouth and say anything, the Lord Jesus spoke. He said, if you will spend so many number of hours in fellowship with me, waiting on me, waiting before me, I will allow you to experience the fellowship with angels, the fellowship with the saints, and the fellowship with the martyrs. That was very enticing. So I thought, oh, 
I've never ever heard anything like this before in my entire life. Whether if there's such a thing called a fellowship of the saints. So I said, yes, Lord, I will do it. So I made a covenant with the Lord. The reason why I'm not going to tell you how many number of hours is because it was specifically tailor-made for me. And when I have said this, I shared this with another man of God, and when they do spend that number of hours, they never experience anything. So it was then I realized this was something tailor-made just for me. So it's not the number of hours, it's the quant- quality. Quality of waiting before God. So, November, December passed by in January 1984, I fasted for 40 days for the first time in my life. On the seventh day of my fast, I spent the whole day worshipping the Lord, meditating the word of God, praying in tongues, and then the last hour, I sat down on the floor to read the word of God. Suddenly I heard the door not being turned. I was all alone in the upper room in our house praying. When I turned, I saw a saint walked in full of glory, wearing a long white gown with a long beard, with a snowy white hair, little bald, with a bald forehead and a scar on his left eye. He walked in and came and sat before me. And he said, I have come to teach you the word of God. So turn your Bible to the book of Revelation. And I turned my Bible to the book of Revelation. And he went through verse by verse by verse explaining to me what it meant from a spiritual perspective. So all the time as he was speaking and explaining, I was listening and also looking at his glorified face. And just stunned by the beauty and the glory that was emanating from his face. And all at the same time, I wondered who this saint was. And I dare not ask him that question, sir, who are you? I dare not. So when he was true with the whole chapter one, he looked at me and said, tomorrow I will come again at this time and we'll continue chapter two. So before he left, I said, sir... Who are you? He looked at me with a big fatherly smile and he said, I'm the one who wrote this book. All I did was... (laughs) You know who it was? So from that time till now, Whenever I read the book of Revelation or any book written by him, he always come to teach me what the scriptures meant from spiritual perspective, you know, which no theologian can explain. All the wisdom of this world are just rubbish, just rubbish, you know. You know, I had one funny dream a few months ago. I saw in a certain person's library tons of commentaries, Bible commentaries from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. One commentary after another commentary after another commentary. As I was looking, I saw the Lord Jesus stand by my side and he told an angel, pack all these books and send them to hell. I was shocked. I clearly heard him say, pack all the books and send them to hell. These are wonderful commentaries written by some great theologians. So so if any one of you have a desire to write a book, (laughs) all right, let's come back now. My message this evening is entitled Serpent Spirit is Coming. While I was fasting and praying in Jerusalem on the 14th of June 2023, 
It happened during this year after we had finished conducting our annual conference in Israel. I always go a few days before and then I stay back a few days or a week after to just fast and pray, you know. So on the 14th of June, 2023, at 10 in the morning, I had a visitation from the Saint Moses. And the prophet and the Saint Elijah came together with him. And they two were present. And the Saint Moses looked at me and he said, a serpent spirit is going to come. This serpent, which is deception, is going to come all over the world and it's going to begin in Jerusalem. A serpent spirit is going to come. Serpent, which is deception, is going to come all over the world. No more in just one nation here, another nation there. No more. This will be a global problem. You know, I tell you one secret. When COVID-19 pandemic happened, it somehow opened a door in the spiritual realm. From then onwards, anything that happens is on a global scale. No more a regional scale. It just opened a door, a door in the heavens, in the spiritual realm, for good and for bad. For the bad, for the works of the devil, they are all be on a global scale. For good, the works of God will also be on a global scale. No more one nation here, one church here, or one church there. No, what God will do will be on a global scale. All the churches experiencing it at the same time. And the works of the devil that take place will also be on a global scale all over the nations, all against the people of God at the same time. What you will experience here, someone else on the other part of the earth will also be experiencing it at the same time. What happens in your church will also be simultaneously happening somewhere else in the world at the same time because it will be a global problem from now onwards. So a serpent spirit is going to come, which is deception, is going to come all over the world. And as the Saint Moses spoke with me, I saw a large, heavy, black cobra coiled around in one corner. It, coiled, it was coiled around and then it lifted up its head and it was hissing. Hissing. So what is going to happen? First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So this serpent spirit is not just one spirit. It is the main one, but below him, there are his cohorts. Millions of them. And they all carry the same anointing. And what is it? To deceive. That is what this serpent stands for. To deceive. And that's what this scripture says. Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now will go out all over the world. And what is their purpose? To deceive the people of God. That's the purpose. Now when will this happen? The scripture says very clearly in the last days. Letter times. Letter times means the last days. Which means our time. In these times that we are living in. The Lord Jesus Christ in the last sermon that he preached before he was crucified. Mentioned that deception will be a sign of the last days. In Matthew chapter 24 verse 5 and Mark chapter 13 verse 22. And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. That's his first sentence. 
when the apostle Peter asked him, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming? The first sentence the Lord Jesus said is, be careful that no one deceives you. That's the first sentence, which means deception will be rampant in unmeasurable manner in the last days. So much so, even the elect will be deceived. Elect are those who work very close with God. If they can be deceived, how much more the common people? There's no hope for the common people. If the elect can be deceived. When Satan, when Lucifer fell, we read, we know from scriptures that a group of angels, not one third. That's wrong teaching. Popularly, wrong, popular wrong teaching of one third. I don't have the time to prove to you that, but you believe what I say. Right? It is wrong. Anyway, many angels, millions of angels fall. Now those angels who fall are not ordinary angels. They are of very high rank, similar to this title called the elect. So they all fell together with him. Big, big, huge demons. Big, big angels who once upon a time served God, bowed down to worship God. They were deceived. Deceived by this great serpent. Now the word deceive in the Greek is called planao. P-L-A-N-A-O. And the word planao means to lead astray, to cause to wonder, to go astray, to mislead, to deceive, to seduce, delude. Simply put, the word planao means to roam away from the truth. Or to put it more simply, it means to go astray. Causing someone to go astray. That's what the word deceive means. If I'm a deceiver, I will teach you teachings, wrong teachings that will cause you to go astray from the true doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what a deceiver is. And that's what deception is going to do in these last days. The serpent has been present since creation in the Garden of Eden. Of all, among all the animals that God created, he also created the serpent. The serpent was not created by the devil. Right, everybody? The serpent was created by God. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says, the serpent was among the creation of all the cattle and all the wild beasts in the garden. So it was part of the creation of God. However, why was the serpent chosen? As I read the scripture very carefully this afternoon, I found something why the devil chose the serpent among all other animals. He could have chosen a peacock. He could have chosen a monkey that never stays in one place. Or a donkey or a horse. More beautiful than a serpent, right? He could have chosen any. Why particularly the serpent? Genesis 3.1 says, And now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Now the word cunning, by the way, Today we have a bad understanding of the word cunning. But this is what exactly it means, cunning. Cunning in the Hebrew means arom. A-R-U-M. And the word arom means wise and understanding. Prudent. Clever. This is what the word cunning means. Positively. In the negative sense, it means crafty. 
crafty very cunning cunning crafty one who devises evil so this serpent was a very wise and understanding prudent and clever beast among all other beasts and that is why the devil chose that if you look at history every false prophet every false teacher or every false religious leader who have ever come to this world so far are not ordinary believers right there are some high ranking teachers wise people clever people who has charisma who has leadership abilities the devil used them because then the masses can be lured away use their cunning wisdom their mind to deceive once when they are deceived they will deceive you in return first it is a self deception comes first then the one who self deceive will deceive another like produces like so that's why the devil was chosen i mean serpent was chosen and the word arum comes from the word aram aram a r a m it it means smoothness smooth talking with a cunning intention deceivers don't preach like me loud and robust they come with sweet words god loves you no matter how much you sin god loves you right they talk sweet words sugar coated words so that you will fall sway sway to all their sweet words they would not speak like elijah he looked at ahab and he said you will go to hell you're doomed i am not the trouble maker of israel you are the trouble maker of israel which one of you dare to go to the white house and look at <laughs> president biden and say you are a trouble maker <laughs> will you <laughs> we will send dr white as our representative see how many will dare today but that is the caliber of a true prophet of god they don't care for fame name popularity money whether you give them offering or they don't give them offering that's okay we do take care of prophets you know those who have nothing will take care of our prophet but those deceivers are not like that they speak smooth words smooth pleasing words pleasant to the eyes pleasant to the ears to deceive so the first nature of a serpent is it is subtle very subtle the way of the devil subtle second nature it incites i n c i t e s incites Genesis chapter 3 was found was one is written very beautifully in the book of Joshua chapter 1 verses 9 to 10 now the extra biblical book of Joshua is also mentioned in the book of Joshua so for some reason we do not know why it was not included in the canon of the bible but it is a valid true book so let me now read to you what jesh how genesis 3:1 is written in the book of jesh chapter 1 verses 9 to 10 and the serpent which god had created with them in the earth came to them to incite them to transgress the commandment of god which he had commanded them so the second nature of the serpent 
is it incites. Now, what does the word incite mean? Urges. It urges. Come on, go on. Sin. Go on. It gently pushes you. It just pushes you, urges you. Go ahead. Take the fruit. Eat. Go. Go ahead. He was lingering, you know, below the tree. And he just urged her. Come on, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. Just like a coach would encourage you. Instead of encouraging, he's urging you. Do it. Do it. Do it. These past few days, I read a very heartbreaking news on the internet, in the BBC. A nurse in England was convicted of killing nine newborn babies. Nine newborn babies. As soon as the babies are born, they are kept in the new natal ward. And this woman was one of the chief nurse who's on duty. She injects the babies with insulin. And the babies die. Nine babies. And when she was finally caught and arrested during her trial, she said, an evil spirit would suggest to my ears that I should kill them. I should kill them. See, no one in the right mind will do that. Right? Babies are always so angelic to look upon. If you don't believe me, look at that baby that's over there. See, it is happily talking together with me. She really understands my voice, you know, Amy. And she's just joining us. Her, she's preaching on one corner and I'm preaching here. <laughs> when I held the baby to dedicate it, it, she was smiling and smiling and smiling at me as if she recognized me even before she was born. So, they are so cherubic to look like. How would anyone in their right frame of mind will want to squeeze their neck and kill them? I'll tell you one true story, okay? My mother almost killed me. Oh, yes. She spilled it in a moment of ungodness. And... Uh, because one day we were sitting and talking, I asked her, was there any unusual circumstances that happened in my life when I was a little baby? And in a moment of an ungodliness, she spilled it out. And uh, the reason was because we were going through great poverty in our family. And I already had an older sister, and my father was a single breadwinner. There was hardly enough money to feed the whole family. So my mother thought, Let's, let me kill this baby. And I can have another baby soon after. So she came very close to the crib. And she put her hand. And at that moment I smiled. <laughs> so she said, how can I kill such an angelic, beautiful, handsome baby? <laughs> Is it correct? Thank you. <laughs> so she came so close and then she let her hand go. See, that is a natural human heart, right? But for this woman to kill nine babies, cherubic looking babies, cannot be ordinary. And she let her confess it was an evil spirit that spoke to her. Kill them, kill them, kill them. And I tell you one truth. Babies have a great destiny in these last days. Yes. Psalms chapter 8 verse 2. God is going to use these babies, even newborn babies, like the baby we have there. They will cast out demons. God will pour a new anointing on their mouth. And they will, you know, in their baby language, they will just speak or even when they cry. To you it is crying. But to God it is not crying. They are singing songs. And the devil will be put to flight. That is the destiny God has for babies. So babies are a great threat to the kingdom of Satan. 
So he wants to take them out. And sadly, so thank God, the Supreme Court overturned the road versus weight bill. Praise God. That, that was one of the great things President Trump did in his office for putting all conservative judges so that they could turn around. And at least something good was done in the nation to stop bloodshed. Innocent bloodshed. If not, your nation would be in greater damnation before the judgment seat of God. So you now have a little window to breathe grace. So thirdly, the devil or the serpent incites. Secondly, and thirdly, it entices. Entices or persuades. And the serpent, Genesis chapter 3 verse 10. And the serpent enticed. And now I'm still reading from the book of Jesha, chapter 1, verse 10. And the serpent enticed and persuaded the woman to eat from the tree of knowledge. And the woman hearkened to the voice of the serpent. And she transgressed the word of God. And took from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And she ate and she took from it and gave also to her husband. Now look at the first sentence. The serpent enticed and persuaded. The word entice means to arouse a desire. When you are enticed, your desires are aroused. For good or for bad. If it is a lustful desire, you will end up committing a lustful act. Like how King David did in 2 Samuel chapter 11. But the same arousal can arouse to seek after God. To seek his love. To seek his presence. So it can either be good or bad. And the word persuade means to move a person by argument. So if you put these two words together, it tells us the serpent inspired by the devil enticed and persuaded Eve to eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It persuaded her even though she was lingering. Should I or should I not? Should I or should I not? But it persuaded her forcefully. Persuaded. You'll find this word persuaded used by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans where he said, when no, Apostle Paul is a very strong-headed Pharisee. Very righteous Pharisee by the strict rule of the law. Never had any unclean food. But he says, all foods are clean. And he said, the Lord persuaded me three times. The Lord had to persuade him because of his heart hate. Persuaded him, all are clean. All are clean. So persuaded means strong argument. You move a person by strong argument. The fourth characteristics of a serpent causes to doubt. A good example is found in the life of the Lord Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 3. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, if you analyze this scripture, the devil did not come to the Lord. Jesus said, sir, you are so hungry for not eating any food, drinking any water for 40 days. Why don't you turn these stones to bread? I'm sure you can do that. It was not a suggestion. The suggestion was the second part. The first part was a doubt. If you are the son of God. See, if you are the son of God, why did he specifically say that? 
because in Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 during the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ the father spoke to him this is my beloved son he said that publicly John the Baptist heard that the Lord Jesus heard that so did the devil right this is my beloved son now the Lord Jesus Christ knew his call that was a call you know the son of God is a title given to him for the role for the incarnation he took as a man to die for our sins son of God if you read Luke chapter 3, the last verse, it says, and Adam, the son of God, begotten by God. So the Lord Jesus, the second Adam, took the place of the first Adam, called as the son of God. So now, the Lord Jesus knew his call. He is the son of God. Here comes the tempter. Are you really sure? Are you really sure? You, are, you have that calling. Are you really sure? Did God call you for that work? Are you really sure? See, he stirs you. And when you get a call, someone else from your church or your colleague or your friends will come and say, are you really sure? Do you have a confirmation? Second confirmation, third confirmation, fourth confirmation, five, six, seven, eight. Why do you need to have confirmations if you have a good relationship with the Lord Jesus? Brother Jerry, where's your wife? Where's she? In the lobby. How long have you been married? I'm going to show you an example now. 35 years. Wow. That's a miracle in American standards. <laughs> Am I right, everybody? Marriages don't last in America, right? Six months, three days. <laughs> hey, wait, don't laugh. The shortest, the shortest, I read in the news, happened three days ago. Got married tonight, next day divorced. Just the next day, divorced. Why? Because the husband did something that the woman didn't like. He spammed her head. He smashed her head on a cake. She didn't like that. So the following day, she filed for a divorce. Here comes your wife. You, you heard me calling you? Okay, please sit down. Good, you came. Okay, let's, let me get back to my illustration. So you have been married for 35 years. All right. And you work in the church here. Do you work here? You are a housewife? Okay, good. So, what time do you come to church every morning? It depends. Sometimes Average? 10 a.m. 10 a.m. And you are here till? Uh, two, two to five. Okay, 2 to 5. Say 5, okay? Yeah. So, 10 to 5, you are in the office and your dear wife is at home. So, she calls you. How does she call you? Sweetie? Huh? huh? Baby, uh, baby to. <laughs> See, all of you should learn that. <laughs> Babito, nice, sweet name. So she said, Babito? <laughs> Have you ever asked, who is this? <laughs> and obviously, either the wife or the husband will say, it's me. Right? And when, she, when you hear her voice, it's me. Have you ever asked, I need second confirmation. Have you ever said that? Has any husband or wife, if they hear their spouse's voice, ever said, are you really sure? <laughs> Baby to, are you really sure? <laughs> are you really sure? I need a second confirmation. Come on FaceTime. 
You don't do that, right? Why? Relationship. Relationship. Don't need to live for 35 years to know her voice. After six months or one week of real intimate relationship. He knows her voice. She knows his voice. No doubt. Even if the telephone lines are bad. You will still recognize your spouse's voice because of relationship. In the same manner, if you have a good relationship with the Lord Jesus, why doubt? Why do you need second confirmation for? The reason why we ask for second confirmation is for two reasons. Number one, we have a far relationship. So we can't clearly hear what the person is speaking. Secondly, our self is so alive. And what the Lord Jesus is saying conflicts with our self. That stinking self. And you don't want to die to yourself. So your self rebels. And you doubt, no, that cannot be God. Because you always expect God to confirm yourself. It's true. You don't want to submit to what God tells you to do. You want God to bless your plans. You pretend to ask for God's plans. You pretend. Christians are great pretenders. We pretend to seek the will of God. We pretend to know, want to know the will of God. In reality, we don't want to know his will. We just want our will to be blessed by him. Or sanctioned by him. I want my way. And I want him to approve my way. If you want that, why seek his will in the first place? Just go and do what you want to do. Right? See how rotten and hypocritical we all are. This is who we truly are. We are great pretenders. Worse than Lucifer. At least he was kicked out of heaven. But God is putting up with us. Every day. And we are worse deceivers than the devil. Because, you know why? I tell you, you are worse deceiver than the devil. Because we are deceiving God himself. Right? You're deceiving God every day. By your pretentious lifestyle. You pretend to live a holy life. You pretend to live a dedicated life. You pretend. If you truly live a dedicated life, a surrendered life, whether in church or outside the church, your lifestyle will be the same. It will be uniform across the board. But in church you put a face, and outside the church you have another face. Aren't you an hypocrite? Double standard lives. That's what the devil, through the serpent, told Eve. If you eat the fruit, you will not die. You can still go on to live forever. And not only that, you will become like God. See? See? That will bring us to another point. Causing you to doubt your call. No, 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 this is not your call. That is your call. Causing you to doubt. The calls of God doesn't change. Like the scripture says, no, the gifts and callings of God does not change. If you did not finish or complete phase one of God's call for your life. How can he promote you to phase two? No. It doesn't work that way. If you are not faithful in completing phase one. If you are not faithful 
in the small things that God asked you to do in this church. How can you claim that now God called me to do an independent church? God called me to start another church. So you break this church and you take half the church away. God doesn't do that. It's the devil who incited you, who moved you to do that. God will never do that. About 30 years ago, I was invited to speak at a minister's fellowship in a certain Asian country. So after the meeting, several pastors came to shake my hands and one particular pastor, a young man, maybe he was in his early 30s, he came and uh, gave me his visiting card and he said, you must come to my church. And I took the card. As soon as I touched his card, I heard the Lord say, don't go to his church. I know nothing about him. That was the first time I was seeing him. So I just took his card and put it in my pocket and forget about the whole thing. Then the following month, I was invited to the same pastor's fellowship again and this pastor invited me again. This time he shook my hands. As soon as I touched him, I heard the Holy Spirit say, don't go to his church. So I backed away. And this happened a third time. So when it happened the third time, I asked the presiding pastor of the fellowship who invited me, who, who is that man? And the pastor told me a very, very heartbreaking story. That pastor, the young man, was a youth pastor in a larger church, in an established of God church. I know the senior pastor because I preach in his church. And the senior pastor built the church from zero. He would go house to house doing evangelism, like what Pastor White just mentioned, conducting street evangelism, house, house to house evangelism, and he brought all the souls into the church and grew the church. From zero to 300. When I went to speak in their church, there were 300. So this young man, was the youth pastor. And the church had many youths, maybe about 50 youths. And all their parents are in the church. So it was a lively church full of zeal of God. They had a great worship team. They will were, they were sing in the spirit. They will dance in the spirit. They will worship in the spirit. And the pastor was a great man of God with the heart of evangelists. He had uh, regular missions work in the Philippines. He goes very regularly to the Philippines and all that. So when the pastor goes away, he always has a visiting speaker to fill in the slots. So one particular year, when the pastor was away to the Philippines, he had a visiting speaker from America to fill in the slot. So the American speaker came. He has come several times to the church. So he's a trusted friend of the church. So this pastor preached his message and then during ministry time he pointed a finger at that youth pastor. He said, young man, God has a great call for you. Your call is not in this church. Your call is not in this church. God is calling you to do a great work. Great work. And so many other flowery words. The following Sunday, this young pastor took all the youths away from the church to start his own church. So when the youths went, their parents went along with them. So that's 50 plus 50, right? Right? Wrong answer. It's 50 plus 100. Mother, father. 50 families. So 150 left the church to start another church. This was before the senior pastor got back home. The righteous thing for the youth pastor that he would have done is wait until the senior pastor comes and then tell the senior pastor, this is how I feel God is calling me, bless me, but you don't steal the church members. If God calls you to start a church, you go out. Let me give you another very practical example. Say, okay, Timothy, 
How many siblings do you have? Oh, so not good example. Okay, how many siblings do you have? Oh, one? Oh, four. Okay, good. You're a good example. And you are? No, no, your name? Kimberly? Okay, Kimberly. You've been married for how long? Six years. So, six years? Okay, good. At least good long enough. So let's say Kimberly, she has four siblings, right? And you're the oldest? Okay. When you got married, now, okay, the American culture is different from the Indian culture is different. So let's suppose you are from the Indian family okay. or from the American family, okay? You grew up in your house. The time comes for you to get married. And then you can find this handsome man. You get married, you move to start your own home. Do you bring your brothers and sisters with you? You want to start your own family? Uh, please observe. You want to start your own family? Do you bring your siblings along with you to start your family? You will go out and have your own kids, right? You understand the point? You don't steal the sheep from your church to start another church if you feel that God truly called you. Go out into the woods. Bend your knees, fast and pray and get a plan from God and then you start a church. Not steal another man's work. So, when the senior pastor came back from the Philippines, he saw his church almost empty. It broke his heart and he went into a depression. He went into a depression and he never trusted another man of visiting man of God again. Never. He closed his church to every other man of God. No one allowed to come to his church anymore. He was a hurting man. He even stayed from, away from all pastors' fellowship. Hurting for a long, long time. So when I heard this news, the Holy Spirit whispered in my ears, this is the reason why I don't want you to go to, I don't want you to, go to that church because it's built on unrighteousness. The foundation that he laid was an unrighteous foundation that God does not recognize. So God does not recognize the church. He will be one of those mentioned in Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23. Where the Lord will say, I do not know who you are, go to hell. You can have a great ministry, signs and wonders, prophesying everything. I don't care who you are, go to hell. You did not build my father's kingdom. You built your own kingdom. Not recognize, go to hell. All your work's gone, all your labor's gone, everything gone, you end up in hell. Why? Because you built on unrighteous foundation. You did not stay true to the call that God gave you. This is the work of the devil. Very subtle. Are you, are you truly the son of God? Causes you to doubt your call. Turn these stones to bread. Means another calling given to him. To do the work of another ministry before its time. Before its time. In John chapter 2, at the marriage of Cana, when the wine was finished, Mother Mary asked the Lord Jesus, please do something. And he said, my time has not come. But when the time came, he worked the miracle. Right? So here the devil was enticing, persuading, inciting the Lord Jesus to do another ministry before his time. It will fail. It will fail. You'll be all alone without the presence of God with you. 
Now, how does this serpent spirit work? How does it work? By inserting little grains of truth along with deceptive doctrines or deceptive teachings. The serpent with its demons is going to deceive God's people tremendously big time in these last days. So the more the people of God should be on guard. The more you should be on guard. That is why it is very important to put on the whole armor of God. Not just one piece. All the six plus one. Seven pieces. There are actually seven pieces and not six pieces. Put on the whole armor of God. So that you will be able to stand against the vials, the deceptions of the devil. Chiefly, you need to put on the helmet of salvation. Protect your mind from all deceiving thoughts that will come. This is where you try to reason. Am I really called? Am I really in the right place? See, all that goes on here and the devil comes to play with you. You will never win the war if you pull the devil into your boxing ring. You will never win the war. You don't pull him into your boxing ring. You go out to meet him with all the whole armor of God. If you try to reason, then you are without the helmet of salvation. You are doomed to fail. Doomed to fail. Now please remember one thing. If the devil or the Lucifer can deceive some of the elect angels in heaven, who are you? Who are you? We are nothing. Nothing. We are made lower than the angels. If the angels can be deceived, how much more us? That is why you need the mind of Christ. Amen. You need the mind of Christ. That is the real helmet of salvation. The mind of Christ. Once you put on the mind of Christ, you will stand against all the wiles of the devil. The serpent, what is unique about the serpent? It is a beguiling deception. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, the first part says, But I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Now look at these two important words. Deceived. Secondly, craftiness. Now the word craftiness in the Greek means cunning. Cunning means twisting God's words. Twisting. Inside, outside, put the grammar and the nouns and the verbs the other way around so that the entire sentence sounds different. It's same, but it sounds different. And the devil is a master of that. Similar to how he deceived Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, we read, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will not surely die is a lie. It's a lie because God said, you will surely die. He said, no, you will not die. You will be like God. You'll be like God. Deception, crafty, crafty, twisting the word of God. And he tried the same trick on the Lord Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands 
they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. That here comes the devil quoting a scripture. Now listen carefully people of God. If you stray away from the righteous path of God, the devil will give you a confirmation based on the word of God. And you will think it is God giving you a confirmation. Because you already strayed away from the path of God. So let me repeat to you one more time. Stop going after this man or that man, this prophet or that prophet asking for confirmation. Stop that. You have the spirit of God within you. Sit down at the feet of God. Fast and pray. Wait on him. Steal yourself. Quiet yourself. And you will hear the spirit of God speaking to you. That is the right thing to do. Hear God for yourself. Then another man, without you asking, will confirm the word. But today, you know what we are doing in our Christian life? We are treating a prophet like an astrologer. A diviner. You go and seek the medium, like how Saul saw the medium. You go to this medium, prophet, give me a word. Do you have a word for me? Why do you do that? Some people come to me like this, no? The Lord told me that you have a word for me. <laughs> Prophet, please speak the word. The first few times I just said, no, I don't have a word. Then I got a little wiser. So the next time, the next person who came to me with such a word, I said, the God who told you that I have a word for you, why didn't he give you the word? Am I right? If he can tell you that I have a word for you, he could have given you the word himself. See how deluded we all are? How we deceive ourselves. It's not God speaking to you. It's your own flesh speaking to you. Your own soul speaking to you. Your own thoughts speaking to you. But you are so dull in your spirit. Not able to discern and understand that. That's the problem. You, mar you end up marrying the wrong person. You end up getting the wrong job. And you end up getting doing the wrong ministry. All because of you going to a diviner. Please stop that. Amen. I'm sure Pastor Chris Reed has come to this church to preach and minister, right? Yes. Now, he has been wonderfully blessed by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When he begins to minister, has any one of you ever asked him a word prior? He just calls you out without you asking for it, right? The Lord gives him names of people or their addresses or whatever other details without you asking for it. Right? We, we did a conference in Charlotte in the month of April. And one of my associates, where is John? Disappeared? So, both of them were in, our, in the meeting in Charlotte. And suddenly, Chris Reed had a word for him. And Chris Reed knew nothing about him. And he was instantly healed in that meeting. Am I right? Instantly healed. Hallelujah. Now John Carter did not go up to Chris Reed and say, Chris, do you have a word for me? Never. He was just sitting somewhere and the Lord worked sovereignly. That should be the way. I mean, that should be the way. See, so don't turn a man of God into a diviner. Don't do that. You are causing them to go astray. Don't do that. You seek God. You seek God. And the living Christ who dwells within you will speak to you. 
through the word of God. I told you I had a visitation with the Lord Jesus this morning, right? So after he, le- after he had spoken, he got up and he left. When he left, he laid a gift behind on the chair for me. This has happened twice so far in my life. When he leaves, he, le- he left a gift behind. And when I opened the gift, it was Isaiah, a scripture from the Bible. That spoke to me concerning a situation I was in. A great comforting word. A great reassuring word for a, a situation that I was facing for the past few months. See, that's how God works. God knows your situation, what you're going through. Without you calling for it, he will call you. He knows you by name. Am I right? Whoever you are, whatever you are doing, he calls you by name. He knows who you are. Let me narrate this incident that really impacted me very much. In 1988, I was conducting a crusade in the Himalayas among the Nepalese people in a town called Kalimpong. That was my home base for 20 odd years until I moved down to South India. So on the final day of the crusade, the tent was jam-packed with 1,000 people. So it was impossible for me to know who had come to the meeting. So during that time of prayer, I saw the Lord Jesus standing by my right side and uh, he gave me many words concerning the people, names of people, their problems and all that. Towards the end of the prayer, the Lord Jesus pointed his finger right at the back and he said, there is a woman standing at the back. Tell her that I'm healing her of cancer in the uterus. So it is impossible for me to know who is there. So I pointed my finger the same direction and said, there is a woman right at the back and the Lord Jesus Christ is healing you of cancer in the uterus. The meeting ended. And everybody were leaving the, the tent or the campgrounds and because of the crowd, I sat on the stage waiting for the crowd to disappear so that I could go up to my room. At the end, one short little woman, she was just about this height, came up to the stage and when she came up to me, one look at her, I knew she was a Hindu woman. If you ever meet a Hindu woman, they have a red dot on their forehead. Have you seen them? So by that, I knew she was a Hindu woman and the red dot also signifies she's a married Hindu woman. If it is any other color, they may be single. So she came up to me She fell at my feet and she cried and she cried and she cried unconsolably for 10 minutes. I didn't know what was wrong. I could feel all her tears wetting my feet. And then she got up. She opened her little handbag and she took out a piece of paper and she handed me and she said, I am the woman with the cancer in the uterus. I was diagnosed with fourth stage cancer and confirmed to die in six months. So I went back home totally dejected from the hospital. I planned to commit suicide. Since I'm going to die in six months, why live miserably in pain for six months when I can just end my life? So unknown, now this is something she never told anybody. But her neighbor, who is a Christian, from the church where I was conducting the meeting, just met her and uh, heard about her condition and said, why don't you come to the meeting? A man from South India has come and God is doing wonderful miracles and healings. Who knows? Maybe you would be healed. So that gave her a little hope. And she said, I wanted to come and see you privately and ask you for prayer. But when I entered into the campgrounds, it was so full, I could not reach you. So I stood right at the back of the auditorium. When you said, call on the name of Jesus, I cried out to him. 
I said, Jesus, heal me. It was at that moment you said, there is a woman there. God is healing you. At that precise moment. And she said, when you said God is healing you, a power came and hit me. And instantly, all the pain, all the stiffness disappeared. Instantly healed. Now, I did not know the woman, but the Lord knew. Right? In fact, you know, the Lord called her, tell my daughter. Who is she? A Hindu woman. But the Lord called her, my daughter. Whether you are Hindu, Muslim, or an atheist, or whoever you are, the religion is only on the flesh, not for your soul. The soul belongs to God. So he still calls you son and daughter. That is one privilege no one will take away from you. That good part. So the serpent, with his seducing spirits, will deceive and cause rebellion. Will not only deceive, but will also cause rebellion. How? I'll give you two examples. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. Satan caused Eve to rebel against the word of God. God told her specifically, you shall not eat of the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He told them, but she rebelled against the word of God. Satan enticed to rebel. Secondly, Jude verse 11 says that a man called Korah, who was a relative of the prophet Moses, rebelled against Moses. You read about this in Numbers chapter 16. Korah, Dathan, Abihu, and Ohaliab. Four of them, all from the tribe of Levi, who were distant relatives of the prophet Moses, rebelled against his leadership, enticed by the devil. So that's what the devil does cause you to rebel. Whenever you feel any rebellion rising inside you, instantly recognize it's from the devil. And stop it. Stop it immediately. Don't entertain those thoughts of rebellion. Don't entertain. If you have a difference with your pastor, go and talk to him. Pastor, I have this disagreement with you. Your pastor will be able to explain to you from his point of view. If you agree, stay. If you don't agree, live quietly. That's the righteous thing to do. You live quietly. And don't bring a group with you. If you ever do that, that is the work of the devil. When he left heaven, he brought a company with him. See, people do that today, right? So why do they do that today? They receive that anointing from the devil. Truly they are anointed. But not from God. From the evil one. Now I have seen this serpent many times. And it is a terrible, terrible thing to look. Terrible thing to look. During the COVID-19 lockdown, I had visited the U.S. and I returned back home and I was in quarantine, locked in a hotel for 14 days. And it happened during that period when I was conducting the, an online course on the book of Revelation. So I had to take a 14 days break from the course because I was in a lockdown. So I spent those 14 days to prepare the lessons on the book of Revelation one night at about 12 o'clock, I sat down to read the word of God. It's always my habit, you know, I always sit down on the floor to read the word of God. And I was, the bed was behind me. After a few minutes, I felt something behind me. You can feel a presence, don't you? So I felt something was behind me and I could hear it slithering on the bed. 
and instantly all the hair on my head stood wouldn't you twelve midnight all alone and all my hair stood up and i did not even turn and look at the back so i just waited for the next action to take place and at the corner of my eye i could see a gigantic snake slithering slithering the fa- the head of the serpent looked like a man it, and i knew this was lucifer it slithered on the bed and then slithered down the bed and then stood up when he stood up it became a man the devil so many times in my life i've seen this serpent the devil and i had seen its eyes even the serpent that i saw that day when the prophet moses was speaking with me i saw its eyes there was cunningness and beguile in its eyes and when i saw those eyes then the prophet moses explained to me the devil uses its eyes to attract people by its enchantment that's in the eyes give you a good example in genesis chapter 3 verses 5 to 6 it says your the woman's eyes were open her eyes were open by the eyes of the devil and she saw once your eyes are open you will begin to see but what she saw in the spiritual realm was not by god not by god so be careful the devil can show you visions he can give you words from the bible he can even carry you in the spirit like how he did to the lord jesus so how to know an experience that you have is from god or from the devil how to know see when the devil carried the lord jesus he was translated from one the desert to the temple in jerusalem one instant translated translocated the lord jesus Christ did not receive it receive it but how did he know it was the work of the devil firstly he saw the devil secondly how he twisted the word of god now before now this is a very important principle to learn before you can discern the devil is twisting the word first you must be full of the word basic principle basic foundation you must be full of the word if you are not full of the word then you are doomed for deception be full of the word once you are full of the word the holy spirit within you will alert you if a wrong visitation comes again during the lockdown this was the first few days of the lockdown so i was sitting in my room preparing the lessons and suddenly an angel of the lord appeared before me and he gave me son of man i have been sent from the presence of god to give you this word when he spoke those words i felt in my spirit something not right usually you feel the presence of god and full of peacefulness holiness even the fear of god come upon you when a true angel or a true saint from god comes but this time i felt in a jarringness in my spirit that this is not from god so i looked at the angel and said did the lord jesus come in the flesh he said son of man i mean sent from the presence of god i said did the lord jesus come in the flesh son of man i've been sent from the presence of god to give you this word so i said stop it and answer my question the moment i said that he dropped down the whole angel he been plop have you you know what is a jello he transformed like a jello and plop fell to the ground into a black mass 
of a spongy jello and then slowly it disappeared initially it looked like an angel but because you have the word inside you the word will protect you the word will protect you if you if your heart is empty of the word then what defense do you have what defense do you have you will be swayed by any wind of doctrine so people of god give yourself to reading the word of god whether you understand or you don't understand read from genesis to revelation read through read one time read two times read three times and then the holy spirit will begin to reveal make you understand the word of god is your only defense nothing else why the eye matthew chapter 6 verses 22 to 23 says the eye is the gateway of the soul it is the gateway if your eye is full of light your spirit soul will be full of light if your eye is darkened your whole soul and spirit will be darkened which means you will not be able to discern when you're not able to discern you will believe a lie you will believe a lie you will not be able to discern right from wrong you must be full of the word then your spirit will be full of light and false doctrines will appear good pleasant to the eyes that's how he felt when she saw the fruit it was nice to see pleasant to the eyes wrong doctrines wrong revelations will appear good and the mind will begin to reason and think false doctrines are good how can they be bad they are good why god loves everybody god loves everybody see that is the truth god loves everybody but it gets twisted since god loves everybody how can god reject this one particular group he cannot reject any group one of the well known men of god who lived until about maybe 10 15 years ago was a man called archbishop desmond tutu have you heard of this name archbishop desmond tutu was the bishop of the anglican church in south africa and he became quite renowned all over the world but during his latter years he became a strong uh, strong not opponent proponent for the lgbt community he began to strongly support them and before he died he made this public statement before hundreds and thousands of people he said if i die and go to heaven if there are no gay people there i will tell god send me to hell i don't want to live in a heaven where there are no gay people this is a public statement you know not a private statement before some friends public statement he said i don't want to go to heaven i don't want a god who will reject the gay people and you guess where he went by his own admission right he said i don't want heaven i would rather go to hell he doesn't know how hell looks like one woman whom i heard had an experience in hell she said not even your worst enemy should go to hell not even your worst enemy that's how terrible hell is so the eyes are the senses of perception and feelings it perceives and then it gives you the feeling which means enticement of false doctrines to make one wise an enticement so what is the result 
of the serpent's work. What will be the results? First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. Underline that. Depart from the faith. Giving heed to. Please underline the next sentence. Giving heed to. Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Number one. Some will depart from the faith. Meaning they will fall away. Fall away from following the Lord Jesus Christ. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 says, there's coming a great falling away in the last days. Coming. And we are already seeing it. People leaving the church. People even who, who once were a time were good spirit filled people. Coming out to say, I no longer follow Christ. Have you heard that? Some very prominent worship leaders in the US have said it publicly. I no longer want to follow Christ. What's happening? Falling away. A great church leader in Europe who founded the largest church in Europe called Ulf Ackmann. At the height of his pastorship, he renounced, I no longer believe in Christ, I believe in Mary. And he joined the Roman Catholic Church. He founded the largest Pentecostal church in Europe. Fall away. A few years ago, I have those records, some prominent evangelical church leaders in the US went all the way to the Vatican and kissed the ring of Pope. Do you know that? Yes. Prominent evangelical leaders. Their names will shock you. Evangelical and charismatic. What's happening? Falling away has started. Number one. Number two, giving heat. What does it mean giving kit? Means moving toward or embracing. So gradually they will release what they had learned formally and believed formally and switch over to focus on something else. Stray away. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 says. Evil seduces will increase in the last days. Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. First they get deceived, then they deceive others. Through whom will deception come? The devil. But he doesn't come personally to you, right? He uses agencies. Three kinds. Number one, false Christ. Matthew chapter 24 verse 5. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So when such people come, it will be very easy for us to identify. Because you will never believe anyone who says, I am the Christ. Right? Okay, good. This is very easy. Secondly, false prophets. Matthew chapter 24 verse 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Now when these false prophets come, 99% of Christians will fall. Why? Because, now, okay, before I tell you about false prophets, let's, okay, because, this false prophet was once upon a time a good prophet. A good prophet who came to your church. A good prophet whose messages you heard on YouTube. You are following his teachings. And then he strayed away. And you didn't know that. You didn't know that he had strayed away. And you will pay heed to the false visions and the prophecies this false prophet will give. 
Jeremiah chapter 14 verse 14. And false signs, wonders and miracles. Mark chapter 13 verse 22. So we should not also run after signs and wonders, miracles taking place in this crusade and that crusade. They are genuine works of God. And the genuine works of God will be attested by the fruit of the Spirit in a man of God's life. Where he is not boastful or attracts attention to himself. Giving all the glory to God. And they live such a godly lives. Not drinking booze after the meetings. Right? So what is the goal of a false prophet? To cause Christians to go astray from following true doctrines. That is their goal. Thirdly, false teachers. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Now this is another one difficult to identify because once upon a time, they were good teachers. False prophets were once upon a time a true prophet. False teacher once upon a time was a true teacher. So when they begin to teach destructive heresies, you will fall. Let me share with you some doctrines of demons that are presently floating in the body of Christ that are thought by false teachers and prophets. Number one, hypergrace. I'm sure you already are familiar with the hyper grace gospel. Where they say. Everyone was. Has been forgiven. Which is technically. Correct. But this hyper grace goes on to say. Even all your future sins. Are already forgiven. Which means. No matter how filthy a lifestyle you live. No matter what evil that you do. They are already forgiven. So just go on. Living as you are. Hypergrace. Is it right or wrong? Hypergrace. Secondly, the doctrine of immortality. Have you heard of that? No. This has been creating havoc in India during the COVID-19 period. Now, what is the hyper doc, uh, immortality doctrine? It's nothing new. The very lie the devil told Eve, you will not die. And the immortality doctrine says you will live forever and ever. Is it true? Even the great apostle Paul died, right? Thirdly, the latest. That's present now. The gospel of inclusion. Have you heard of that? Gospel of inclusion. That gospel teaches that everyone, including gay people, are all in the kingdom of God. No matter what your lifestyle is, you are included in the kingdom of God. That makes a mockery for God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? And in the book of Revelation, it states very clearly, the abominable, the effeminate, and the gay, the homosexual, will not enter into the kingdom of God. Period. No argument against that. Then where did this gospel of inclusion come from? Doctrine of demons. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. The Lord Jesus Christ very strictly warned us. In Matthew chapter 24 verse 24. That even the very elect will be deceived. 
which means senior saints of God in the church, senior ministers of God, the elect will be deceived. So, what should we do? What is our safety net? Matthew chapter 24 verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed means discern. Discern carefully whatever you hear. Any visions, any prophecies, any revelations, any teachings, discern instead of swallowing wholesale. Especially when there are a barrage of teachings on the internet. Please be careful of what you hear on the YouTube. Be careful. Don't just swallow everything like a baby that will start crawling on the ground. Don't behave like that. Be wise and discerning. Attend a good church where your pastor is a true man of God who walks with God and produces the fruit of the Spirit. He's a man of prayer. Attend such a church. Don't just simply attend any church for the sake of attending a church. It's about time you come out of Babylon. About time. Don't stay in Babylon any longer. Come out. God is tired of all the false pastors. And they are deceiving his flock. They are draining his flock. They are milking his flock. And they are destitute of food. That is why there are tons of sheep without shepherd today looking to the internet for church services. Some find good churches, some find wrong churches. You should attend a church which is a praying church. A church that prays is the house of God. Because the Lord Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. If there is no prayer in our church, don't go to that church. They can have good teaching, good preaching, good singing, good prophesying, good ministry. Don't. It's a lopsided church. Attend a praying church. And make sure the pastor is a praying pastor. And also, the shepherd should be a lover of souls. To reach out to lost souls. Go to such a church where you will grow like a plant that's planted by the rivers of living waters. Amen? Amen. Let's all arise for a word of prayer. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, and the Lord Jesus. I have spoken to your children. All the words that you put in my mouth. And everything that you showed me. Concerning. The serpent spirit. That is going to come. To deceive. All people all over the world. Now I lift up. Each and every sons and daughters of yours in this church and those who are afar off watching this service online today. Lord, I pray, keep them, Lord, from the evil one. Keep them from the evil one, Lord. In John chapter, John chapter 17, you prayed, talking to the Father, Saying, you have lost none except the son of perdition. All those who have been entrusted into your hands, you did not lose them. So I pray, each and every one 
who has come to this service today. Lord, I pray, number them. Keep them in the palm of your hand from all deception. Never again should they be deceived. Never should deceivers come in their midst to deceive them. Never again false prophets, false teachers, false evangelists, false men and women of God should ever come to this church. Come and lift up your holy hands everybody. And bless the name of the living God. Open your mouth. And bless the name of the living God. Come on everybody, open your mouth. He's a good God. Bless the name of the living God. Come on, stand up to your feet. Lift up your holy hands. Open your mouth wide. Give thanks to God. Give thanks to God. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul, rejoice. Thank the Lord. Yeah. Bless his holy name. God. For he is worthy of our praise. 